Thank you, Melissa. And of course, what Melissa doesn't say in that introduction is I would never have done it had she not been uh, at the University of Oxford uh, then. Uh, and that was a set of uh, quite happenstance decisions about what I would do with my undergraduate lectures, which have changed my uh, professional life and lots of things I do um, quite, uh, quite without, without my planning. Um, what I'm going to do today is go through some of those um, OER activities um, that Melissa outlined uh, from the point of view, uh, not, not of an expert in learning technologies and not uh, as somebody who has researched in some ways how these things work. So I've learned actually already an enormous amount today uh, about the work many of you do. But from the point of view of an academic doing this sort of on the side or doing this as part of my everyday work and reflecting a bit on what I've learned uh, during the course of that. So I guess I've got a kind of uh, subtitle. One of, the things, um, one of the things I wanted to try and talk about uh, with you this afternoon was why academics, including me, are worried about this. You know this already, you encounter them. Some of you are uh, uh, maybe in that category uh, as well. W what it is that we uh, are worried about and, and how those worries might be um, counteracted or repurposed in some ways to be helpful and reflective ways about using OER resources. But I want to start with a kind of parable from my own work, and this is a parable about um, OERs and openness, I think. Uh, this is a story about the Bodleian Library. 
The Bodleian Library was founded at the beginning of the 17th century um, as a repository for uh, all books published in English uh, due to an arrangement with the Stationers Company. In fact, they didn't want all books. They only wanted good and respectable books. And one category of books they did not want was plays. So 1603, this is right in the middle of Shakespeare's career. It's probably uh, the most golden period ever in English literary culture. And what's happening goldenly is happening in the theatre and Oxford with a um, actually rather familiar to me looking back, a capacity to miss what's right under its nose, decided no, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go for that. But they do make a decision to go for the first collected edition of Shakespeare's plays, the first folio in 1623. And you know that book, um, but there's a picture of it there, and a picture of the uh, original 17th century library in which it was stored. It was stored in a chained, um, uh, ch chained environment. Um, something quite interesting to me about that in terms of our uh, interest now in, in openness. And you can see on the bottom of the closed book, uh, the notch, the nibble that the chain has taken out of the cover. Um, so this is a book that uh, became part of a university library which had some, uh, which had some aims to be open, uh, to be open to certain categories of people. And we've been talking all day, I think, about uh, how openness means different things uh, in different contexts. By the middle of the 17th century, though, this... Um, most important of English books had disappeared from the library. Uh, and one of the things I've been interested in in a lot of my work is how uh, apparent repositories, places where things are kept safe, are actually very permeable. Things move in and out of them all the time. And that's actually quite helpful for me for thinking about ongoing questions we have about how we might preserve uh, the digital material that we're creating now. I kind of think we won't, probably, and that's probably fine. Um, and that we should pop, maybe be a bit, a bit cooler uh, about that. So this, this book, um, just as a sort of um, forerunner to that, this book had left the library by the middle of the 17th century. And it seems to have left it because there had been a new edition of Shakespeare, the so-called Third Folio, and the Bodleian, again with an unerring uh, ability to do the wrong thing, thought that it now had a new shiny version and it didn't need the old one anymore. So this book was sold off as a kind of piece of, of spare kind of scrap. Let's just have a look uh, at that. I don't think that was exactly the, the, the <laughs> thing, but you, you, you understand. It was, a bit, it was a bit like that. Okay, so the first folio uh, goes from the Bodleian, uh, and uh, it's missing from its collection for uh, two centuries. We fast forward to the beginning of the 20th century, when a young man, a student at one of the Oxford colleges, comes with a book in a bag to the librarian saying, we've got this old book and my dad is wondering about having it rebound. As soon as the librarian opens the bag, he sees that book with that nibble out of its cover uh, and realises this is the copy that we let go from the library uh, 150 years ago. This then starts a, a, an enormously interesting uh, ch chain of events, and it will come round to openness, I promise. Um, firstly, the librarians uh, are so pleased to have got this book back that they begin to trumpet uh, in an enormously bragging way how wonderful a book it is. They think that uh, it is the most perfect copy of this book uh, in the world. Uh, it's, it's not, and actually that doesn't exist, no, there's no such thing, but they, they trumpet that, and uh, that attracts a rather uh, unfortunate piece of interest. The man there in the cartoon with a copy of Shakespeare's first folio under his arm and a Gainsborough painting under the other arm is a man called Henry Folger. He's an executive with Standard Oil in New York, in, uh, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And he is a monomaniac for first folios. At the point when the Bodleian first folio returns to Oxford or re-emerges from, uh, uh, from loss, he has bought 30 copies of this book and he's on his way to getting another 51. 
So uh, he circles around, uh, attracted by the idea that this is the best copy of this book he could ever have, and he offers a completely unfeasible sum uh, to buy it, £3,000. Uh, it's at least uh, ten times what it was worth, or rather, perhaps we should say, what it would have cost on the open market. What it's worth is a much more difficult question, uh, but it's very, very expensive. What happens is that the Bodleian begins, rather haphazardly, a fundraising campaign, essentially a crowdsourcing campaign, to get £3,000 to keep the book. Uh, it writes uh, to, it attempts to write to alumni, this is the first university development activity ever in the UK, uh, it's enormously laborious and sometimes uh, when I've talked to our development colleagues they feel we haven't got much better at this. Um, but they write to people, they write to, they put adverts in the Times, uh, they try to uh, activate uh, sort of local pride um, and particularly national pride. Nobody knows that it's Henry Folger who wants to buy it but they're pretty clear it's an American. And this point uh, is one, one of the letters that comes back uh, up there in the top corner, hoping it's possible to raise the sum required and to prevent this treasure going the way of all our English treasures to America. There's a um, massive transfer of English cultural property to the US at the beginning of the 20th century. It's really, really fascinating. Lots of that property had already been expropriated by the English in the first place. So it's things like Renaissance, Italian Renaissance paintings. Nobody could get too worried about that. But Shakespeare seemed so Englishly English that he became, his book became the kind of standard bearer for this uh, cultural uh, inferiority complex. The Bodleian raises this money through this uh, very, um, the, a number of very small gifts. Uh, in the end, there are uh, more than 100 contributors, uh, and most of them give relatively small sums of money. Uh, so it's a really um, sort of ground up kind of, uh, kind of fundraising campaign. I think rather counter to what they expected. I think they thought that some wealthy person would, try and would put up a lot of the money. So we get a lot of letters in the archive about uh, ordinary people um, saying, uh, here's half a crown, uh, here's a guinea, uh, here's, here's 50 pounds. In fact, uh, one man writes to say, I did send you a guinea, but could I have it back? Because I've fallen on hard times since then. Um, and I think, he does, I think they do send it back. Um, but these are small sums of money from people who are not very well off. And the book is bought for the Bodley and then it comes back to the library. Now, this is a great, um, uh, Freud would have a field day with this. This is an amazing story for the Bodleian of sort of loss and return. Um, that they have done a very good job in, in, in suggesting that this was a sort of accident somehow that it was ever lost rather than a, uh, a, an absolute a committed error. And they've also done a good job in suggesting that while it was away from them, it was just really not being appreciated and not loved at all. And really, it was just waiting to come back home. Uh, so it's an important narrative for, for them and for their sort of institutional identity. If we fast forward another century, by the beginning of the 21st century, when I wanted to look at this book, uh, it was judged too fragile to be consulted. And it was part of, during that time I was, I was working on uh, the first folio, the history of the first folio, and I was invited to give a lecture to the Friends of the Bodleian Library, who are a rather conservative group of people who raise money and, and, uh, for, for the library. And I decided that I was going to go into this with guns blazing. So I told the story of how the Bodleian had got this book back, and then my coup de grace at the end was to say, and the thing is, it would have been better if Folger had bought it because he would have looked after it better than we have. It would still be possible to open it, to turn the pages, uh, and the fact that it isn't means that we have completely squandered this gift uh, that was given back to us by the generosity of, uh, of our donors. This went down very badly, as you might, as you might imagine. <laughs> very, very badly indeed. Um, but it did galvanize one uh, really important project, uh, a project to digitize uh, the book and to try and make our digital surrogate uh, the best one that we could at that time, the most responsive, the, the best quality images, the most able to, to turn the pages, um, the most able to search, and also, of course, uh, openly um, accessible and uh, reusable. We can look at that 
In fact, I'm, we'll go straight to that. We can look at that uh, now. The website is firstfolio.bodleian.oxtaact.uk. Um, it's, it's a great project, and I'm, I'm, really, I'm really proud of it, and I'm proud that uh, a huge number of people uh, made, that, made that happen and made that book available in a way which spoke to its history uh, in, a particular, in, in a particularly appropriate way. We did actually refund this digital digitization project by repeating um, the, the, the appeal to people to buy the book back and repeating the, the appeal to get small donations which we did uh, in 2012, where, where we, got, we asked for a donation of £20 to make up uh, £20,000, which was uh, the cost of digitising. This has been quite an interesting sort of parable for me about um, uh, how open access works, has worked in my case very much as part of uh, an institutional context. Um, and I was thinking from our question, really uh, great keynote this morning and our question time afterwards, uh, the thing I'm really able to talk about is content uh, and a little bit about how content shapes um, uh, open educational practices and is shaped by, by them in turn. But I also need to think about sort of privilege, uh, which I think was importantly highlighted uh, right at the beginning of the conference. Um, I, I work, and I'm very conscious that I work, at the intersection of lots of different kinds uh, of privilege, uh, I work in a privileged university. I have the privilege of quite a lot of control over my own professional time. Uh, I can do, if I want to do this kind of thing, uh, nobody's stopping me, and similarly, nobody's making me do it. Um, but I also, more problematically, work at an institution which is associated, uh, sometimes justifiably, with social privilege and has been uh, for, for centuries. That makes openness and the language of openness uh, important to us, but it also means that we can, uh, I think Oxford is in, a, is in a particular position that it can be dishonest uh, about um, the extent to which openness really uh, reorders uh, hierarchies. And I thought about that a lot to do with this particular project. Uh, what we did was to put this, this big book, this 900-page book, up, you can you, you can uh, you can scroll through it. You can turn the pages. You can search for particular words. There's a transcript. Uh, you can download image sets. Uh, you can do all kinds of things. But I still think that you need to know quite a lot in order to make use of it in any way other than the most superficial. Superficiality is not bad. I'm not against superficiality. I'm deeply superficial myself, if that's not a contradiction in terms. Um, but if you actually want to, th this to be a resource that people can use um, in, in a more scholarly way or can develop their own understandings of Shakespeare, it needs more material around it. And one of the things I've come to think about open education resources in my own discipline, in literature, and in the humanities more generally, is that they've been much more comfortable with putting up other people's material than with putting up our own. That's to say, uh, humanities scholars are very interested in how you might put up documents, uh, copies of early books, um, uh, playbills, archives, those kind of material from uh, uh, university collections and so on. Uh, what we've been much less good at is putting up interpretive material, teaching material, the kind of stuff that uh, humanities academics are producing all the time for their day job of teaching and working with students, but that which I think is pretty much lost to the wider community and to individual uh, learners who might be accessing that material. I think there's more to do with, the, with, with this site um, and more to do with this as a resource. A couple of things that we did was to have uh, workshops with teachers uh, talking about how you might use this in the classroom. Uh, and that made me think that there's um, a, a sort of hybrid model with which you're probably already quite familiar, but we needed to stumble on. A kind of hybrid model which puts uh, a digital and online material next to some kind of face-to-face -face interaction which helps people uh, think that uh, which walks people through uh, what's there and what they might do with it. Now, I know you can walk people through what to do uh, in a remote way, but something about the difference between the online experience and the face-to-face -face experience seemed to work for us in doing those, um, uh, th those, th those teacher workshops. I'm just going to go back one just in case you're interested in more first folios that get lost. Uh, it seems to be an occupational hazard for rich people who have these books and don't 
don't, don't look after them too well. Just in case you're interested in the Scottish uh, first folio, which we authenticated uh, just last week, uh, it's on display on the Isle of Bute uh, over this summer. It's a beautiful place uh, to go, and they are very keen, I think, that this um, very kind of charismatic book that they have in their library might help to leverage uh, some of the uh, tourism potential that there is uh, on Butte. Sometimes when I look at this slide, uh, this, this would be my, in some ways, my answer to Catherine's question before, if open is the answer, what's the question? I kind of feel this is the question. I mean, it's a question about private ownership, uh, isn't it, and what that means. Uh, uh, private ownership in all kinds of ways, in economic ways, uh, but also in intellectual ways. I'm just going to move on to another project which we did um, uh, as part of OER, this Great Writers Inspire. And I wanted to bring this up uh, to try and reflect a bit on something I already touched on, which is uh, sustainability, uh, how long, what, what lifespan we think OER items should have, uh, what's, their, what's their kind of natural life, lifespan, uh, and uh, what do we do with them? Um, can we euthanize them? What do we do we just wait for them to kind of dwindle away? Are we waiting for technical uh, changes to, to make them stop working? Or do we actually put them out of their misery uh, earlier on? You, you see where I'm going. This is, a great, this is a great site, and we worked with school teachers, particularly on how to manage uh, a transition between uh, school-level English literature work and university li literature work, not just for Oxford, although obviously with a strong um, sense uh, of our own potential benefit from this. Uh, you don't need me to tell you that undergraduate access, uh, it's kind of social justice in, in, in sort of high elite university admissions is the biggest uh, single problem, I think, uh, facing Oxford and other places at the moment. So anything we can do that actually does make it possible for people to come uh, to, to meet the requirements of our quite difficult academic courses, I think, is a, is a, is a plus. What we did was to bundle together here quite a lot of resources that already existed as e-books um, in order to sort of tr to try and develop able students beyond the set texts that they might study in the classroom. We tried to uh, package these up with uh, kind of author-specific themes, but also some more uh, critical themes, ideas about feminism or how literature and history might relate to each other. We recorded some new lectures, short lectures, from university academics uh, to try and uh, sort of bring the whole thing together. So this was a project which was um, partly reusing stuff we already had and trying to make it more visible, make it more intelligible, uh, and, and then trying to develop some new material which helped people to understand how they could navigate through it and what kind of things that they were looking for. It was a really successful project, and for those of you who are involved in this kind of thing, it was, uh, it, it was presented by the uh, English faculty as one of its REF case studies, uh, and REF impact case studies uh, were, were a strong part of the English uh, submission. Um, I have mixed feelings about that kind of instrumentalization of uh, impact uh, case studies, um, which I'm sure many of you have had experience of. Uh, but it, we gathered a lot of statistics and we had a lot of feedback and a lot of, again, we did this, the, the thing of going into schools and working with people uh, on this material, um, showing, showing them, again, we felt that it didn't quite fly on its own. Um, uh, and the, I just think, still don't think we've quite got that right, how, how you could self-teach in a way which is not completely um, linear, how you could self-teach with a load of OER resources. Uh, I, I haven't seen that done really well yet, but I think a lot of people, a lot of us are trying to do that better. So Great Writers Inspire was doing really, what was doing really well. We had some JISC funding. Uh, the funding ran, ran out for that. Uh, it's maintained in that the links are kept going, but we're not adding material to it. And that's quite an interesting um, point, I think, now, uh, to, 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 to think, what do we do with it? Uh, do we wait to get another little bit of money? Um, a lot of the money in this field, you'll know this better than I do, seems to be very, very much project-oriented. Um, is, the, is the assumption that we will just absorb the projects and their ongoing maintenance into what we normally do when that funding's dried up, or that somehow uh, the project is over when the funding is over? I think there are quite a lot of resources kind of hanging about still uh, that perhaps nobody is, is really looking after. 
and maybe, maybe we ought to think about culling them uh, in, a more, in a more rigorous way. I think that unless we put some more material into Great Writers Inspire uh, in the next uh, 18 months or something, probably this is something which we should think about uh, disaggregating and putting, just putting back into a general, uh, disaggregating all the, uh, all the items and putting it back into a general uh, kind of OER pod. The last thing I want to talk about, um, because I wanted to bring up the idea about uh, f academics' fear and the fear of openness. Um, Catherine started us off with a, quite an emotional definition. One, one of the definitions she picked out on that slide was quite an emotional one, being not hidden uh, emotionally, being not closed off uh, emotionally. Uh, and I think there is a, that's a really useful uh, definition of open uh, to, to have in mind when identifying what it is that people find worrying about this as a step, what it is that academics find uh, worrying. And although this, for me, has been the most transformative thing that I've done, simply putting my undergraduate lectures on iTunes, this is not a technical miracle. I, I do understand that. This is a thing that is really ordinary and that lots of people do. Um, uh, it's, not a, it's not a thing that so many people had done uh, in my environment. And it's a th but it's a thing which has... Um, completely transformed the sense, my sense of the audience to whom I might be speaking. I began doing this by uh, really just in broadcast mode. I was already lecturing two undergraduates. Um, one of the things about my environment is that uh, we don't really do centralized timetabling. You can often be lecturing at a time which, for very legitimate reasons, is not very convenient uh, for students. Uh, I thought that my own students would benefit from being able to pick up the lecture at a point which was convenient to them. Uh, as Melissa said, it was the point when Oxford was thinking about iTunes U, and that seemed as good a format as any uh, to make that possible for them. I didn't really imagine at that point that there would be a wider readership, and I couldn't really imagine there might widen a listenership, and I couldn't really imagine how anybody found anything really on iTunes U or, or would sort of come across it. So it, seemed, it seemed very, very unlikely. Once it was clear that they were being listened to by a much wider um, uh, cohort, uh, there was one very, very good outcome, which has been a good outcome for me all the way through this process, which is people uh, wrote to me and said, thanks for doing it. We're, it's really nice to have them, uh, which, which is just an, an, an unalloyed nice thing. Uh, occasionally they asked a question about something, but not in a way which was burdensome or couldn't, couldn't be managed. There may be some iTunes use superstars who can't manage their mailbag, but I'm not, certainly not one of them. Um, so that was a good thing. The bad thing was it made me terribly nervous about lecturing. Uh, so things that you would just say off the cuff or uh, that you would feel quite happy with, um, uh, you know, sometimes... You all know this. Sometimes your lecture is good. Sometimes it's not very good. Uh, it's kind of you just kind of go with it, really. And it's it's just one week, and you're back the next week, or you've got another chance to do it. If you're recording them, well, you sort of have to go with that, I suppose. But it's magnified, and its impact is is magnified. Uh, I found that very very difficult to think about, and I also found it difficult to um, uh, kind of be in the moment in the lecture while thinking this is going to be listened to uh, by lots of, other, lots of other people. Sometimes that was quite funny. Somebody told me that the Bishop of Southwark listened to my uh, iTunes lectures. And I suddenly heard myself uh, a few weeks later talking about how Midsummer Night's Dream was really about bestiality. And I started to get the giggles thinking about the, <laughs> the Bishop of Southwark. So I did say, I don't know if the Bishop of Southwark's listening, but... Um, <laughs> Shut your ears, shut your ears, Bishop. Uh, so so some, sometimes that had, a funny, that had a kind of funny aspect to it, thinking uh, there are people listening who are not here in this room. But sometimes it had a kind of more, uh, uh, a more paralyzing aspect to it, and I did have a gap between uh, some of the series of the lectures that I put up on iTunes U. When I went back to recording lectures, I realized the style I used had changed, and in some ways... Um, the style I used in the lectures was less interactive than it would have been. Um, it was more, slightly more formal. So in some ways, uh, I was making a step forward by making this material available. 
in some ways I was making a step backwards by making a certain kind of rather old-fashioned lecture that you know, someone like A.J.P. Taylor would have done in the 1950s or something, and I hope not with the same content. Um, but no, qu no questions within the sort of recorded period because it's a bit too complicated to get people to agree, uh, permissions and so on. Um, uh, and no, uh, I did smuggle in a handout. I usually lecture to a handout for students. Um, but I, I started to, have to stop mentioning the handout because people who would listen to the lectures, this sounds a tiny thing, I know, but uh, people who would listen to the lectures would email me and say, maybe I could have that handout. And then I'd be trying to find it, and I'd be worried about the pictures, and what, did I have permissions for the whole thing? And it all was too, uh, m much too complicated. Uh, so I did change those in certain ways, but what I didn't change, and what I don't think I would change, is that these were real lectures in real time, with a real, often coughing, uh, and disruptive uh, audience, and that, as Melissa said, I, I recorded them first on my uh, iPod, and then uh, I think I record them on an iPhone now. Um, so they're not they're not wonderful products. Um, they are, and, and so sometimes people write to me and say uh, th these aren't wonderful products, but more often they write and say we love the idea that we were in an Oxford lecture and that this was a real thing. Uh, I also feel that maybe making quite a rough cut set of lectures slightly inures me from one of the problems that being in a position of privilege in this OER world gives you, which is the idea that your institution might somehow crush other ones. So I think of this as the kind of Michael Sandel problem where the philosophers from San Jose University wrote to him to say, we're really glad you've done your MOOC, but we're really upset that our dean wants us to use it in our teaching, in our university, and that probably means we'll be sacked, ultimately, um, because we'll be using you instead, and there are all kinds of problems about that. My lectures would never be a kind of, they would never be taken up by uh, anybody else because in that way, because partly because they're on slightly random topics, um, and that they're designed to make people think about plays uh, rather than to go through a kind of syllabus. Uh, and partly because, as I say, the quality is not, is not good enough. So there's something a bit secondary about them as artifacts, and I actually like that. That's tr true to the process we've been through, I think, and that's something uh, I would like to retain. So I suppose, thinking through that, the most exposing thing, then, about being involved in OER has been to put up lectures. Uh, it's really easy and fun uh, to, to coordinate all kinds of other resources and other material. It's been fabulous to work with collections and to think about how you might make that material more accessible. Uh, but there's no risk in that, really. There's no personal <coughs> risk at all in that. The risk is all about uh, when you put your own material up there. But I really increasingly think that in the humanities, that's what we must do. We must put up the interpretive material, the more tactile, kind of haptic sort of material which helps people to do the job that the humanities are about, which is the job of questioning and interpreting. We are not a data-driven uh, discipline, um, and I think we have been lured by uh, big data kind of ideas from the sciences, uh, the idea of the database. Every uh, humanities academic I know wants to make a database of something. And you think, yeah, well, that's, that's kind of great, but um, uh, not, sort of not really. That's, not really. that's sort of not really what we do. And it's not really all that the internet can do, and it's not really all that open educational resources can do. But just to, just to conclude what I've been saying then, I think what the difficulty is, is how we reward people for putting their material up. And that comes back to questions of privilege. Um, it's not too difficult for me to do it. In fact, it's very easy for me to do it, and I get quite a lot of approbation for having done so. I already have a tenured job. I'm enormously fortunate in a very difficult academic environment. Uh, it's not so difficult then for me to do this. There's, no, there's, more, gain than, there's more gain than loss, but, there's, but that's still about using and leveraging a reputation which needs to be made in the academy as it works at the moment by other means. You cannot, as a modern uh, academic, scholar academic, I don't think you can make your name in, o, in OER material. I, don't think that, I don't, still don't think that works, either in scholarship or in teaching. And I think that there is, a, there is a, a, uh, an aspect of modern academic life which has made us, uh, us as academics, more and more unwilling to 
risk material which we don't think is complete or to risk um, the kind of peephole into our teaching um, which is, retains a kind of mystery uh, uh, that nobody sort of wants to, or wants to penetrate. I think that's a step change for, for, for us that we need to make as academics. And the thing that I keep telling my colleagues, um, and you must encounter this too, is that often when you talk about uh, how to make material more, more accessible, how to make it more available, people present with a technical issue about why they can't do it. Uh, it's absolutely clear to me that there are no te I mean, the technical issues, are absolutely nothing at all, are they? That technical issues almost always are proxies for uh, deep anxieties, some of which are entirely justified about the way the academic world works, and others which are just, you've kind of just got to get over yourself, you know, you can't be as private, teaching is not as private, it's a public, it's, it's a public job, it's a public duty, uh, you should let other people see what you're, what you're doing. And I think if we could get past the idea that um, OER is somehow a kind of technical or a technological uh, phenomenon, and to think of it as uh, a pedagogical one, but really as a kind of ethical one. I think we may be able to uh, pr press pressurize, I think, I think that is the right word, we may be able to pressurize more academics uh, to, to center it in their practice, both as teachers and as scholars. Thank you. Do you want to say this one, and then we'll go to the back. Hi, uh, I'm Laura Angulo from the University of North Scotland. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any advice for those of us who are learning technologists trying to get academics to engage with projects like the one that you have done. Because I know, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but for me, sometimes it's like my deep to get them to, to try and do things uh, digitally or to experiment in that way. Um, uh, I, I, completely, I completely see the question, and one way, um, one of the many ways I feel uh, fraudulent standing here talking to this particular group is that I have had almost no effect whatsoever in my own institution uh, in making more people do this, um, and that's, that, that, that's something for me to, to ponder. Um, I, suppose the, uh, I suppose the question for me is to try and understand why it is that people feel they can't, they can't make this step. And as I was saying, I think that um, sometimes it seems too complicated to, to manage uh, and there are ways of stripping out that complication. But really, um, uh, this is about uh, a kind of perfectionism in academics. I think academics quite often are perfectionists. They want something, they need something to be absolutely finished before they do it. So then we, we've never really got, in my discipline, we've never got work in progress going as an idea. Um, people put, if you, if you advertise for work in progress, you get some completely finished sort of book manuscript. And people say, I just thought, you know, this is sort of where, where I am with my thinking now. And you think, yeah, that's just going to be published. You're not going to change what you think. So I don't think we're very good at revealing that our processes, actually. And maybe, maybe that's what's stopping your academics doing it. And m many people feel under an enormous amount of, of pressure, don't they? I mean, as, as I'm sure you do in your roles, but feel under a lot of pressure to do to do lots of things in different directions um, and maybe feel exposed that they're being asked to do things that they don't feel they'd be very good at. Um, was there. Uh, Rob Barrett from Liberty University UK and OER. <clears throat> Thank you for a really interesting talk. Uh, I'm not from a humanities background myself. Um, and, you know, we would talk in no uncertain terms not to share effectively, um, not to share your work, certainly not in an open access journal, that would be seen as a lesser quality, um, not to share ideas that weren't fully developed in case they were taken by someone to be your fully realised ideas. Um, and this, this is just part, I think, of the wider culture in the humanities, which is really hard to understand, right? Because I think people who, who write, essentially, want to be read, um, and they want to communicate ideas to a wide audience. And to me, it's, it's institutional culture that stops them from doing that. It's the fear of not having a good enough impact rating or something like that. Um, so I wonder if you have any thoughts around 
uh, how that culture might be changed for the better. I know you've hinted at some of these things already. Um, and when you think in the humanities especially, there's so much to gain from being I think I think you I think you're absolutely right in the force of your question. I think the hu, I think the academic humanities has failed in finding an alternative model which it itself can believe in for academic publishing. Uh, so we, we've continued to give our labour uh, as reviewers and editors of journals, um, and then we have also been curiously unconvinced by open various kind of open access. Uh, requirements. There's an enormous amount of resistance to that in in, in the academy, as I, as I see it, which I I sort of understand, but but I feel um, actually I don't understand. No, I don't understand it. But I wonder if you're absolutely right, uh, and I don't mean this entirely facetiously. I wonder if you're absolutely right to say people uh, people want their work to be read. There is a slight sort of inverse relationship between readers and value, I think, in the humanities, which has always had, English literature perhaps particularly, has always had an inferiority complex about whether it's difficult enough. I and mean, a lot of the history of English literature is about trying to make it more difficult or more scientific or more closed in order to give it the kind of cachet of a proper academic discipline. So it may be quite hard for us, in a way, to step back from that and to, to acknowledge how much um, close kin we have with non-specialist readers uh, and that we are not really a separate, uh, a kind of ontologically different uh, kind of academic being. So I, I feel that the question of, I was thinking of using, and then I thought there were too many gender problems with this, but there's, a, there's a, um, something which is often quoted in book history. It's a, a Venetian judge in a trial which is partly involves a Gutenberg uh, printing press, which is why he says it, but the, the, pr the sort of proverb is, uh, the pen is a virgin, the printing press a whore. And there is a sort of ongoing sense through the history of technology that too much spread, too much openness. I started to wonder whether openness is one of those words which is slightly differently gendered or comes uh, an open woman perhaps is a slightly different person from an open man or, or the connotations of open uh, are a bit different there. And I think that's been touched on, on quite a lot. Uh, I think there is a worry that you can be too... Uh, lots of people have, have re reasonably kind of good-humouredly kind of um, twitted me for saying, you know, all those people listening to your lectures, you know, there must be something wrong with them, <laughs> either them or the lectures. <laughs> You know, that to, to give a lecture that nobody wants to go to is the sign that you're actually really quite an elite, <laughs> quite an elite person. <clears throat> I'm going to draw to a close. Uh, Great. Uh, 